Science live stream. This is a uh, one of a continuing series of meetings about the quantum computing capabilities that we are building for Wolfram Language. Um, these may show up as an actual built-in feature of the language, or they may show up first as a package. Um, and it's been a little while since we met about this, but we are going to see what has happened here. So let's start off. Do we have an example of... Um, Ah, what happened to my screen there? Okay. So what is this thing about removed wire names? So last time, part of our discussion um, centered around the fact that a previous version of this package um, uh, required you to specify uh, names for the wires um, for each part of your quantum state um, or, you know, which uh, wires or quantum objects, I was calling them, your quantum operations were acting on. Yep. Um, and we decided that that was probably not the best thing to do. Um, and in fact, uh, after a lot of thinking, it seemed best to get rid of the wire names um, entirely. Um, and in fact, um, looking at other quantum computing packages, like for instance, um, the um, uh, quantum information uh, science kit in Python, um, they uh, just use numbers for everything. Uh, which they have different constraints. They don't have a symbolic language. They don't really right. want to do much else. So, right. but, so this uh, still allows for symbolic computation completely. Um, everything is still symbolic. Uh, it just didn't make sense to use names for the wires. Okay, well, let's see how you actually represent a, um, a circuit then. Where is... Okay, so here you're trying to say... I don't even know what this is... So are these, the, are these the actual diagrams that we had figured out? No, so that's just um, a holdover for a generic quantum circuit. The, the diagram is what you see below under circuit diagram. Um, okay, so, okay. so let, let me see how you build that up. And, and the, that looks like named wires to me, A, B, C, whatever. So that's, uh, so you, in the quantum circuits, you can actually specify, you, there you can use an option to specify um, names for, that go along with each of the wires um, in the circuit diagram. Okay, but, but, but don't, okay. So let me let me see how we're now building, how you're now proposing to build these things up. I'm not seeing where a quantum circuit. Where is there an example of a quantum circuit here? So the first quantum circuit is right there, circ one. Okay. So what does this mean? So that means that you have a power, a sigma x operation, um, which is uh, earlier on in. The, the notebook and a Toffoli operation. Um, and the, the sigma x operates on the first qubit and the Toffoli act on the second, third, and fourth qubits. And we really think that this arrow, okay, so let's find out what your x actually is here. Okay, so your x is a sigma x here. All right, so let's take a look at that. So that represents that matrix operation. Arity is one, right? It's Hermitian, yes, it's unitary, yes, okay. So that's an example of its matrix representation. That's dandy. Mm -hmm. and, and then beforehand, or at one point, uh, you had to do lots of weird things to specify what the qubit dimension was. But now the default is two because qubits are most uh, frequently used. Yeah, yeah, right, 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 right. This is nice. Right. Yeah, that's nice. Mm -hmm. um, um, and this, this format that I'm using now, quantum matrix operation, um, I split things up beforehand. I had just quantum finite dimensional operation and there were many different things um, that you could do in that, um, but it ended up being very complicated with lots of keywords and, and things like that. So I decided to go with quantum matrix operation for unitaries, but also non-unitary operations like raising and lowering operators, um, like, like S plus and S minus, mm -hmm. um, and then a different construct for measurements. Um, that's all you, it turns out that you need just those two. What's this quantum finite dimensional state? So the quantum finite dimensional state is you still need um, something to represent quantum states. Um, and so this right here says that you're gonna make a quantum register um, that has three qubits or three qubits um, and um, they're together, they're in the registers in the five state. What do you mean the five state? You mean it's the state, the state um, 101 or something or what? Uh, precisely. Okay, um, that's a little weird, if I might say so. I mean, okay, because well, we, can, we can figure well, it out. The, the, okay, but hold on. Let, let's let's go back here. Okay, so the idea is these are 
Matrix operations. By the way, why is C not, which is capitalized there? Why is it not capitalized? You can, you can do it either way. So I um, I did some uh, um, type uh, casting, which um, with no matter how you uh, spell it, like if you either way. Well, but but we we need to decide what canonical it is. What what does C not stand for anyway? Complementary not. Is that it's right? It's a controlled not operation. Oh, controlled not. Right. So in our usual way of doing this. So what, what we do, let, let me just think, what do we do in the Boolean case? So in the Boolean case, when we have to name things, if we say, for example, Boolean convert. Um, and I actually use that, I'll uh, go to that later. Okay. Um, okay, so Boolean convert has this notion of a form and for its forms, it uses the capitalized versions, mm -hmm. okay? So I think probably what we should do here does this support um, the actual full form controlled not? It probably should. Okay, so we should have a version where it's spelled out and a version where it's capital C not. Okay, so yes, those are things that I'm uh, that it will it will support. Um, okay. So right now, like um, I think instead of sigma x uh, uh, for x, if you put in just x or if you put in pally x, I think both of those will work. Okay. Okay. Nice. I mean, it might be a little confusing, but I think it's nice. And eventually, uh, you know, eventually we should make, um, uh, you know, eventually we should do do actual linguistics. So you can type control equals controlled not and get the right thing. I'm sure if I type control equals not, I wonder what on earth happens. Uh, it's a word, but it's also probably, huh, fascinating. It doesn't support that being, that's interesting. That probably should be extended to actually, um, Sushma, can you, can you yes. make a note of that? I mean, mm -hmm. that's a slightly, it's a slightly bizarre case because I mean, if I say something like uh, P and not Q, I'm sure we'll get a nice result there. But so something, go ahead. Uh, something also, which uh, you'll see later on in the document um, is the uh, support for um, Boolean functions in quantum circuits. So it turns out that even for non-reversible classical Boolean functions, um, there is a way, um, and I've, I've programmed this in, to uh, represent those using reversible quantum circuits. Um, and so one of the examples down below, okay. yep. two, um, it's just there's some a Boolean function that's given, and you say quantum circuit of Boolean function goes to whatever the Boolean function is, and it'll generate that for you. Like this, like Boolean function arrow. Uh, no, arrow, you can just put in P and and not Q, and it'll do that. How does it know what the variables are? So that's what, if it generates, it'll generate the quantum circuit um, where in the diagram, the... So, okay, so it's going to assume if you say P and N, not Q, the only constraints are on P and Q. Yeah, fair enough. But then, so it's going to name P and Q. Right. So it's going to name the, the variables P and Q here. Right. So whereas, whereas in this case that I'm doing here, there's a case where, okay, so if I do that, how do I get something out of this? So if I say matrix representation or something, what, what can I uh, So if you do circuit diagram. <laughs> that's nice. So that's a very simple one, actually. But um, right. Nice. So this is just I just did the formatting um, very quickly. Um, the main thing was actually programming it all because there's only um, the only operations, logical operations that can actually be converted to uh, quantum reversible analogs are um, X or and and not. Um, so you have to make turn everything into the ESOP normal form and Boolean convert. Um, and then use um, the XOR. Um, you can basically use a control not operation to do XOR. Um, sure. And you can use Toffoli gates to do uh, AND. Okay, but, but in the end, this is, okay, we'll go, we can get to this in a minute. But in the end, this is not going to be, so I put P and Q in here. So that's just um, representing them. When you actually put a quantum state in, you don't have to name P and Q. It just, it'll assume that 
you have your I have a two qubit quantum state that's input. Right, but is is this extra wire basically a garbage wire to deal with that, the fact that it's not reversible? No, the extra wire is where your result goes in. Okay, but so so then the the reversibility is dealt with by having stuff come out on those wires. Is that correct? Uh, so P and Q end up being the exact same as they were beforehand. The only thing that that changes is the result register. But how can it be reversible? It's so got the, to be reversible. The, yeah, that, go ahead. That you're representing these classical Boolean functions using only a bunch of reversible operations, and then you perform a measurement at the end, which is irreversible. Yeah, but I mean, at the level of this quantum, I see, and you're doing a measurement on that wire there. Exactly. So the measurement is on the result okay. register. Okay, fair enough. Okay, cool. All right, I need to understand a little bit more, but let's keep going on what you were doing here. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So if I were to just put in a matrix here, uh, so then that would work too. So if I just say quantum uh, matrix operation, and I do like a, um, uh, well, let's just do, I say I do identity matrix four. Okay, so I didn't like that. So what should I have done here? Do I now have to say QDIT in order to make that work? Uh, Q to dimension goes to two, or Q to dimension goes to four. Either one works. No. Uh, Why didn't this work? That should work. It's programmed into work. Um, well, let's just try um, the two case where we kind of know. No, something's wrong. Okay, no matter. So this is a bug for now. Yeah. Okay, what does this mean? So this is the pure symbolic case, or no? This is the case where you already set the value t. Or no, it's that's symbolic right there. That's okay. Okay. So it right. doesn't. There's no errors or anything. It just keeps it symbolic. And actually, for quantum states, you can keep things symbolic even when you're doing uh, products like tensor products. Um, Good. Make... Okay. All right. So let's take a look at this creature. So this is. I think this is slightly exotic. I mean. Quantum finite dimensional state. Okay, so you have here a quantum register. What does the three mean of size of three bit quantum register? Mm -hmm. Yep. It's a little weird that that is, I mean, that form. So in general, what we would say is, you know, something like register length, or it's basically the number of bits in the register and then register state arrow. And I would have thought it was more natural to say 101, um, although you can certainly turn, the, turn that into an integer, but I would say that that would be a better way to do it. Um, this is something that Jacob F and I discussed recently, whether it's better to have um, some sort of chronicler approach to these, in which everything is flattened into matrices, or yes. rather this other approach you are suggesting in which we still keep the dimensionality, the original dimensionality of things. And I think we should support both somehow, just in case. Okay, so let's try to use. understand this quantum. Okay, so you've got a quantum finite dimensional state. Okay, great. And that's the number of those bits. Okay, fine. I mean, it would be nice to know. Okay, so what is the sparse array here? What is that thing? So if I if I say, can I say matrix representation of that thing of the Q reg? Uh, you can thing? say state vector, like this. Uh, so Q reg of state vector. Um, and then matrix form. You can also do density matrix instead of. Okay, so I don't understand that. What what did this mean? Oh, so that that is, I see, that's the fifth. It's in position five. Yeah, position six, because in quantum, uh, you start from zero. Mm. You can actually also plug in, you can say um, basis states. Instead of state vector, you can say basis states. Yeah, I understand. I, I understand what's going to happen here. That's far from wonderful. 
Okay, I can forget the matrix form there. Great. But so what? I mean, it's in a particular, it's in the 101. That's the basis state. But the question is, is there a form of this where there's an association where it says basis state arrow and then the amplitude? That would get really messy in states that have a lot of um, non-zero components. Well, but it's, look, this, hold on. The zero origin thing is going to cause us trouble. So we're going to have to deal with that. Now notice that what we do in the case of uh, if I say rule plot of, um, let's say, Boolean function, let's say, 7, 2, okay, it does, it starts with the 1, 1 case here. See what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I mean, it goes from 1, 1 down to 0, 0. Now, that means, so what that's doing is, Okay, we have to think about what that means for these things, because it's obviously just a convention what the order of this, that this thing is indexed. In other words, if you take the state vector and you index into the state vector, what you're really doing is indexing according to, with states into the state vector. And you're not, the fact that those states are encoded by integers is its own separate can of worms. Is that making sense? So, I mean, the, the true version of that, the representation of a state might be that cat there. Right. And then, then the question of what you actually get for the fifth element, so to speak, other than the um, quintessence of antiquity, but, you know, the, the fifth element, whatever it is, the nth element here, um, the... Uh, um, Okay. All right. So let's let's keep going and we're going to come back to this. Okay. 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 So this is a trace. What does mm -hmm. that mean? So that means you're tracing over the first uh, qubit. Right. So if you were to do two in there instead, it would give you a different answer. Indeed, I would hope that. Okay. Fine. All right. So okay. yeah. What is this? This just says that you can have, you can make a state that has all, um, you know, symbolic coefficients um, and keeps everything symbolic for you. Um, and before when we had nested arrays to represent entangled states, this is automatically representing an entangled state um, without any of the nesting that was complicated before. So let me just try to understand this. So this is, QDIT dimension is two here, but what would happen if I just were to take a single alpha beta here? Then it would just be one QDIT instead of two. Okay. What if I took three of those things? Then it will complain? Then you should get an error. That's not a very pretty error. Well, so I, I haven't worked on that yet. It's yeah, mostly... Fair enough. Fair enough. Okay, fine. So that so So what we're doing here is we're untangling. So I think there's gonna be a messy issue of how these things are numbered, okay? Because what you're doing here is you're essentially untangling tuples into this vector, right? Just the same way as the basis states above. I understand that, I understand. Mm -hmm. We already have a convention for doing that in Boolean functions, right? And the convention we are doing that in Boolean functions, let's take a look at what we do. Because, okay, so let, let's look at this. Let's look at um, Boolean table of P and not Q, for example, PQ. Okay, so what that's saying is false, true, false, false. So what that corresponds to is, let, let's do a Boolean table of PQ. So I think it's going to say, yeah, there we go. True, 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 false, false, true, false, false. Right? Mm -hmm. Now, uh, okay, I've got two comments here. First of all, we need to do the correct mapping between true, false, and one, zero. Um, and we probably need to support true, false as inputs here. But let's let's come to that in a minute. Um, but the main point here is that we're going from one, one down to zero, zero, which means we're eliding the nastiness with zero origin stuff. See what I'm saying? Mm-hmm which I think is it's better to go the other way around like this than it is to have to be off by one. Um, 
perhaps we can make this configurable because I, it could be that some, I mean, it's traditional somewhere to start with zero ones and then we can have like a list zero one that we, or, or one zero and then you have one zero or zero one depending on what you write. Right, so it sounds to me like the convention in Mathematica is um, different than the convention in the traditional quantum computing literature. So maybe I think what Jose is suggesting is that um, maybe we allow an option for uh, what the convention is. Yeah, I, I think that will be a mess. I mean, I think that the question, let, let's work through it all, okay? And let's see whether we need to do that, all right? Because, because you could say that, I mean, you know, you notice how Boolean functions work, right? So what we now have to do to make a Boolean function, we're now numbering the Boolean functions, right? We're numbering Boolean functions starting from, with, with this ordering of what the bits mean, which is a completely arbitrary ordering, right? But it's the same type of thing as you have in the basis states here. Right? Anyway, let's keep going. I mean, I don't think anybody's probably numbering quantum operators right now. Like for example, there's a definite numbering of all the, you know, like like I think um, na I, I think um, XOR is seven, if I remember correctly, which we can probably see from any of this stuff. Um, okay, so let me try to understand. So so we have unraveled the state in term in the same way as this unravels the state, albeit maybe backwards, but we'll worry about that later, right? Mm -hmm. And then when we say quantum finite dimensional state, what is this actual matrix here? What so that's, that's a state vector right there. That's okay. just, those are just four normalized components. It's just alpha, beta, gamma, delta divided by the absolute value. Okay, so this is just alpha and beta. What is that horribly messy expression? Why is it so complicated? Isn't it just ab squared? It, yeah, I, it should be. I don't know why it's... Well, so let's just see what happens if I say full simplify on that thing. So... Right, how, how, do I get, how do I get that expression out? Uh, so you could do full simplify of asymbolic of state vector. Wait a minute. This thing here, symbolic state vector, is that what you're saying? No, just do state vector. Okay. You don't even need to do symbolic. Okay, 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 okay. Okay, and now I can say normal of that. Okay, so now let's say full simplify of this. I think there's gonna be a problem because of the assumptions we're putting onto alpha and beta. No, not really. Okay, so we need to understand why this got so messed up here. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll try to figure that out. Okay, so That's this I understand, this I fully understand. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure why it got so complicated. Um, it, there's definitely, you know, a, a way to make it simpler, and I just need to figure out what exactly happened. Okay, fine. Um, so, you know, going forward, these are just yeah. more state specifications. Okay, by the way, somebody on our live stream is, is mentioning this is somewhat similar to the from, from Boolean function, which we came up with a better name for. And maybe Sushma remembers what that name was, or maybe Jose remembers, because we probably implemented it now. The, the last decision was to true-false. Oh, yeah, true-false, right. To true-false. To true-false. True yes, that, that's the last thing we decided. Right, because we decided that... that um, and so what that will do is to take one zero and turn it into true or false. Different, there's a different operation from this. Okay. So now let's go back here. So what's happening to this? So these are just uh, some of the you know, ways that you can specify quantum states. Okay, fine. Why does there have to be braces around these? Um, because if you don't have braces around um, the outside, you could have just been specifying a symbolic array like we did in the past case. Um, like if, if, what symbolic array? Wait, wait. So if you look again up, up at quantum, quantum finite dimensional state of alpha and beta, um, if we just had a single ar uh, array there and we didn't have two, um, then we wouldn't be able to support potentially multiple 
substates. Yeah, I understand. So, so what you're saying is, so, so for example, if I were to do a, um, you're saying in this case here, I could do five plus five plus. Is that correct? There's an example of that right below. Oh, okay. It's, but so now, what does this mean? So phi plus is this state, which is two, a two-qubit state, and this is a four-qubit state. Um, mm -hmm. So it just took the tensor product of those two. And now, because you don't have wire names, you don't have any of the, you know, the difficulties that come along with that. Okay, so hold on. Let me understand this. So if I want to make a circuit out of this, no, what am I doing here? This isn't a circuit. This is just a state that's some kind of... Uh, Okay, direct product state. So, right. for example, for that, I don't even know what this is. Why are there only four elements specified there? So, because, how would I get? Because you only had two elements specified in each of the five plus and oh, five. Oh yeah, yeah, right. Okay, fine. And why are those six, seven, ten, and eleven? Uh, because when you take the tensor, if you look at the non-zero elements of five plus, right above. Okay. Okay. Okay, so this is ultimately going to be a 2 to the 4, i.e. 16 dimensional, as it says right there. Yes. Okay. Um, uh, there's ahead. an example of that right below. You can see 5 plus 5 minus, or psi minus, as prod. Okay. These are just... And so this is saying, if you want to specify the states with the specification, state specifications, you can do that as a list in quantum finite dimensional state. But if you have quantum finite dimensional states, you can also just take the product of those as quantum product. Because it could turn out that you have more complicated quantum states that you've developed along the way by acting on them with circuits or operations or measurements. Yes. Um, and you can just take quantum product of those with quantum product right there. Right. So that's equivalent. So you're telling me that if I take quantum product of, let, let's say I just do just to make sure I understand what you're talking about. If I say phi minus here, um, I do phi plus just to be consistent here. And then I do the same thing again. Uh, you're saying I do this. I get that. So that's equivalent, you say, to the more degenerate form of just putting so I don't quite understand. Why would I not just be able to put a quantum finite dimensional state inside this other quantum finite dimensional state to represent that quantum product? Because these are, I'm trying to think of a way of putting this. So for one, you could have quantum states that are mixed, not pure. And so you'd have to represent them with density matrices. Yep. And so... Right now, there's no way of generating a quantum finite dimensional state that is mixed just from uh, inputting an array. You have to actually create a mixture with quantum mixture, which is below. And so if you wanted to take a quantum product yeah. of a mixture and something else, for instance, yeah, then you'd need this quantum product formalism. I see. I see. Um. I still think that this is um, a nicer way of doing things than before where we had, um, you know, the quantum objects goes to and quantum product goes to and quantum mixture. Um, we had a lot of keywords almost uh, before. Yeah. I think having separate I symbols for these. Just looking at some. Uh, I didn't, haven't we looked at this? Haven't we talked to this person? Uh, yeah, he's at Stanford, actually. Oh, didn't we talk to this person? I don't think so. Maybe I ran into him somewhere. I thought there was some interesting stuff here, but but um, uh, if we he actually uh, worked with the research group that I'm in right now. <laughs> well, okay, so maybe you could contact him. Um, the uh, uh, the person on the live stream is claiming that. Uh, one issue is numbering states that he deals with. So yeah, tensor uh, networks are a, a different way of representing quantum states. Um, that's somewhat distinct from this, which I'm, I'm doing right now. 
Okay, well, can we? But but it, it sounds like. Um, oh yeah, I've looked at this. I think yeah, right. Well, okay, but so so can you explain what a tensor network is? Okay, so it, the case that we're interested in is um, the matrix product state, um, which uh, basically you can represent each quantum object um, in a large uh, array or grid or whatever you want to call it, lattice of, of uh, quantum objects by some type of tensor. Um, and the bonds uh, or, the, or the couplings between different quantum objects are represented by uh, these tensor indices, uh, which you can contract and, and things like that. Um, the reason that tensor networks are useful is that for certain types of states, um, and in particular for low entanglement states, uh, area law states, um, where like the, the scaling of the entanglement goes with area, uh, which happen to be uh, those of physical interest, many times like ground states and the lowest excited states, um, can be represented much more efficiently in terms of the number of non-zero components um, to good approximation in tensor networks um, than they can using full Hilbert space formalism. So let me understand this again, okay? So what you're saying, I mean, here, this is an outer product. I mean, the, the basis here is these various outer products of possible uh, of, of states. Is that is that right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So in a tensor network, is the is somehow the basis not represented in that same way as a as a complete outer product like that, or what? Uh, you you don't actually need all of those. You what you do for a tensor network um, is each of the tensors. Uh, you can, so you have a bunch of non-zero components um, for each, basically instead of having a state vector, you take the density matrix um, and you look at that and you take the eigenspectrum and a lot of the, um, for, for low entanglement states, a lot of the eigenvalues will be very close to zero and you can just discard them to good approximation and truncate the dimension of your Hilbert space. I see. So, so it's eigenstates, some kind of eigen, essentially eigenvectors of the density matrix. Is that right? Right. And you're keeping the ones that have decently large eigenvalues or something. Right. That's a, a method called, as known as the density matrix normalization group, uh, which is used to uh, iteratively truncate the dimension of the Hilbert space. Um, so, okay, so let me try to understand that. So that that's... Um, this is well, getting pretty far removed from what we're doing right now, though. Okay, but I want to understand that. The, I mean, I want to understand how that relates because that's another representation. So that's something where you're, where you're backing out from a bunch of... I mean, it's a question of what the... I mean, what you've got here is something... I mean, it, it's a compression scheme, basically, yeah. for states and quantum states. Mm -hmm. and, and it's used a lot in like high-performance scientific computing um, when you're trying to uh, model and simulate quantum systems of many particles. Yeah, yeah, I've heard about this. Right. I mean, this is a this is a, a since my time kind of idea, right? Because back in back in the day when people were first doing this, um, yeah, this this is a comparatively recent invention, I think. Um, but, I mean, a question, given that we're talking about those kinds of things, um, this is where this starts to intersect with the things we're trying to do in computational chemistry. And um, arguably, we should get Jason to join one of these meetings at some point, unless he's going to say he only knows about uh, quantum chemistry and not quantum anything else. Um, but that... Okay, so in a quantum spin system, for example, the, the type of thing you're talking about would be relevant. Is that true? Yes. Um, and uh, a good, if, you, if you're if you looking on GitHub, um, a, a really good library that's used a lot um, for these type of things is iTensor. Um, okay. So yeah. that's that's like the um, the best one that I know of that, that performs these type of computations. Um, well, what, what's the computation to perform? I mean, the computation is, is basically doing what kind of, I mean, like finding a quantum ground state given for some system of the Hamiltonian 
that's represented, where the states of the system are represented in this way, or what's the idea? So there is a, the whole um, algorithm for iteratively truncating um, involves uh, sweeping back and forth um, along your spin chain or whatever um, you know, configuration you have. Um, and it, there are some subtleties there. Um, there's also um, some subtleties when uh, you time evolve uh, your system instead of just finding the static ground state. If you want to continue to maintain your uh, uh, tensor network representation, yeah, I understand. As you right. evolve in time, yeah, because because the ultimate thing is is not the particular eigenvalues, eigenstates of this um, uh, density matrix thing, and it might turn out that you don't anymore have that the things which are important are not the things which are the high lying eigenstates of the density matrix right in other words the presumably you have to re-sweep it to find out what the you know to re-represent it in terms of those in terms of eigenstates like that mm -hmm. i mean in um but let me just try to understand i mean so how that relates to what we're talking about here because that's a case where you have a spin chain and you have um uh hamiltonian for the evolution of the spin chain, right? Right. But now, in our case here, we don't really have any Hamiltonians in sight. We just have the unitary transformations that exactly. correspond to the discrete time, you know, e to the i h t for the Hamiltonian. Right. But presumably, for a spin chain, you do the same thing as well. I mean, I believe people have made quantum cellular automata that kind of way, where you basically are applying a discrete, you know, unitary transformation. Although I'm, what is the relationship between, I mean, the confusion of that is always that you have a local Hamiltonian, so which, where well, that depends only on neighboring spins, but then mm -hmm. the final unitary operation is something that is a big kind of uh, thing that operates on the outer product states. Right, and that's why in addition to having um, these, matrix product states, um, there's matrix product operators, which are um, extensions of this tensor network formalism to uh, operators like Hamiltonians. Okay, okay, so so the basic bottom line is, this is a, um, uh, it's a numerical scheme for dealing with essentially quantum spin networks that, ignores essentially the small components of the states of the right. amplitudes right um, and the it, claim is yeah. renormalization group procedure does it basically uh you know traces out or integrates out irrelevant degrees of freedom that's that's the main well, but the renormalization group has you know has the other feature that it's actually trying to do some scale change somewhere which i don't think is what you're talking about here I think so. This is, is very loosely based on on that type of renormalization group procedure. I see. Um, okay, fine. But but so I mean, one of the bottom lines here. Uh, the reason I'm pushing on this a bit is because we need to understand in our setup here, um, what's the analog of? I mean, okay. First of all, how would we make a spin chain? How would we make the analog of a spin chain? I believe your register, your quantum register, is basically a spin chain. Mm -hmm. You know what's really outrageous about this? When I worked on all this nonsense back in 1981, this was exactly the thing we were doing with quantum spin chains and trying to figure out uh, the evolution of quantum spin chains, which I guess is more difficult than, um, I mean, I guess the thing that one thinks about, so let me just walk me through for my physics understanding. Okay, so we've got a quantum spin chain, which is like our quantum register. True or not true? Is that that's true, yeah. Okay. All right. So now in a one way to do that would be to say there's an identical Hamiltonian at every spin on the spin chain. Mm -hmm. And so what would that look like for so these various operations? What I mean is it like evolving a cellular automaton where you're just taking 
what, what, what is it like? It, it, explain to me that, that a Hamiltonian at every, an identical Hamiltonian, it's like an Ising Hamiltonian, for example, mm -hmm. right? So let's take a naive, let, let's take a naive pairwise Hamiltonian, which is just, well, no, let's take the, um, the Hamiltonian is, you know, uh, for every S sub I, let's say times S sub I plus one, plus mm -hmm. S sub I times S sub I minus one. Okay, so a, a a simple Ising like Hamiltonian. Yeah, you don't actually even need the uh, the second term you just mentioned because that's degenerate with if you okay. sum everything. Fine. All right. So it's just the the pairs s sub i s sub i plus one. Right. Okay. Now what? So now what does that correspond to in terms of the quantum circuit stuff? In other words, uh, that spin chain is going to have a future time step. That is the result of sort of one unit of time operated on, operated according to the Hamiltonian. Mm -hmm. so right. What, go ahead. Uh, so basically, you use the uh, local Hamiltonians to generate a global Hamiltonian. Yeah. And, but, yeah. And then, you know, you would discretize your. Uh, you know, shorting your evolution using things like the Hubbard Strachanovich, you know, transformation and things like that. Um, okay, so this is the thing that I remember back from the distant past of like 1981. This was a hard thing that is going from the local Hamiltonian to something reasonable in terms of a unitary transformation that wasn't just you take the whole system of n spins and you figure out the unitary transformation for the whole system of n spins. There wasn't a way to to uh, break that down into sub pieces, right? And that's that's why this um, you know density matrix normalization or the TDMRG it's called the time dependent density matrix normalization group procedure is used. Okay, but so walk me through what the analog. If if I have a circuit that has a bunch of you know random you know, I don't know what, control not gates or something between pairs of spins effectively, okay? Does that correspond to some Hamiltonian? And if so, what Hamiltonian? So, uh, first of all, the Hamiltonian is Hermitian, uh, which you're not guaranteed that any circuit that you generate is Hermitian. Um, the, the circuit is just guaranteed to be unitary. Um, so yes, there's that. Right. Um, so, so you can off the bat say that you're not necessarily guaranteed to have it be any Hamiltonian. Well, so wait a minute. So if you believe that you have a circuit, how do you, what is the time evolution of a circuit given, in other words, if you look at, how do you implement a circuit in terms of time evolution? So generally, uh, I'm, I'm not entirely sure what you're saying, but if I, if I, uh, think i think what you're saying is that in general like physically what happens is there's different time steps um and like at each time step you perform different operations in your circuit yeah i understand that but i'm asking even for a single time step i want to actually make my circuit i'm going to build some actual circuit um and how do i i mean and the circuit is described by some hamiltonian which is a generator of infinitesimal time translations basically Mm -hmm. um, and the question then is, you know, but I actually then make it run, right, for some finite non-infinitesimal time, mm -hmm. and the result of that is supposed to be some unitary transformation that corresponds, let's say, to a controlled knot, mm -hmm. right? So I'm asking you, what is the Hamiltonian that, when run for finite time, gives you controlled knot? Uh, I'm not entirely sure just off the bat um I, I yeah right i'm suspicious about it. i think it's kind of some kind of mess i mean i think it's one of these things where um but okay so so we're de dealing with a different level of approximation in the quantum circuit case where we're just saying okay there are these blocks of unitary transformations that are happening and we're not asking the question what's the underlying hamiltonian right it would be nice to understand how to pull those things together for um yeah okay fine all right so let's let's put that to the side for a minute um although all right great okay let's keep going 
what is quantum entangled objects? So that's asking whether, what is the one and two here? So you take any quantum state, which S1 is a quantum state here, um, which is, you know, phi plus, uh, phi plus, um, and you make some uh, bipartition. So here, it's because you made this S1 state, you generated it again in, above, if you take the phi plus, the one above the S1 that you chose, um, yes. So, and then if you go down there, because it has to be a bipartition of your system. Um, entangled, looking for entanglement in a quantum state only makes sense if you take bipartition um, and you look across that. Okay. But so if I take this, I just redefined S1. And if okay, I'm not mistaken, you, one, three, one, three, three, four, something like this, then I should, blah, why didn't that get an answer? Am I confused? Uh, that should work. I need to look at that. Okay. Um, do you think it will work if I say one, two, three, four? Let's try. Suspicious I am. Okay. I don't know what that's doing. Okay, fine. Um, okay. Yeah, I need to look at that again. Um, okay, no problem. There may be a bug there. Okay. All right. Quantum partial trace. So that's, so that's tracing over that. Uh, that so that your second qubit in the quantum state. Yep. Okay. So that's my original one there, which in now in this case here should be a much bigger creature. Yep. Okay. So that's the density matrix corresponding to. The phi plus phi plus. Right. Which, on one hand, can have a state vector that is then, yeah, it's it's 16 dimensional in that case. It's a mm -hmm. length 16 state vector, or it's a 16 by 16 density matrix. Right. So you could plug in state vector there, and it would do that for you. Let's try and see. No, the matrix form, you should keep okay very nice okay fine so uh, go ahead oh i was just going to say that um the, the more interesting stuff is actually a little bit further down okay okay so this right here is um you're creating a quantum mixture of s1 and s2 um but this is in terms of symbolic uh you know weights t and one minus t yeah, I remember we talked about this last time, of of trying to have those weights not be, yeah, okay. And then actually, if you go down a little bit further, there's actually even um, quantum plot, which you can manipulate. Um, so you have to define S2, I think. It's, uh, yeah. Well, I probably want to redo the definition of S1 to be the yeah. single thingy there. Cool. Okay. So, now, so if I do this, that will now be a length four thing. Okay. Now, if you do, yeah, manipulative, if you do the manipulate one. That is the most disgustingly, you know, like business graphics. Okay. Well, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm not a graphics person. No, I, was, I, I understand. I'm just amused. I mean, it's kind of like, like quantum computing meets, you know, business graphics. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. In any case. But the general idea is there. The general idea is interesting. Okay. So the general idea here, this is representing, so this quantum mixture, you say, and I'm not convinced by the plot aspect of it there, this quantum mixture if I said normal of this, what would happen here? Anything? So you could do normal of like the density matrix of that, for instance. Okay. So let's take percent 60 density matrix. Okay, very nice. It's actually above right there. That's S3 density matrix, it's like three lines above. Yeah, okay, fine. It's nice. Okay. Okay. All right. Let's keep going here. Um, State distance. Yeah. So 
there's a bunch of different uh, methods you can use to uh, measure the distance between quantum states. Um, and how do they relate to our other distance measures? So, I mean, like, for example... So one of the options is Euclidean distance. Um, I think below, you, there's a, a list of them, I'm actually, just like a couple lines below. Okay. But there's a whole gaggle of these... Um, you see, if you go down a little bit further, just a little bit more. There you go. What are these things? I mean, so like these are all the, the ways that I could find where people people actually use to measure distance between quantum states. Right, but that's an analogous to our things like you know binary distance or Manhattan distance or something like that here. So I mean, if I were to say something so i'm just trying to understand the design here if i say manhattan distance between you know one two three and three two one for example. okay so what you're saying is maybe instead of coming up with my own um quantum state distance symbol maybe i should try to work it out um by having it integrate with the uh yeah that's what i'm thinking but i, I don't even know whether there's any sense so explain to me what what one of these methods like the the uh, i don't know the fidelity what what is what what is this computing? I mean, if I have the quantum states be, uh, you know, vectors of length four or something, is this just a mathematical computation like this Manhattan distance is? It's a mathematical computation, um, but it's something that is. Uh, so, for instance, the fidelity is used to tell um, after you perform a computation on a quantum state, like you can take the input um, and like the or the output and what the ideal expected output was, and you compute some measure of like how close the two are by, um, it ends up being something like taking the matrix uh, square root of the density matrices and products of those density matrices. Uh, but is it the case that this thing is basically taking two vectors with a bunch of um, parameters in them and working out, you know, some uh, computation that could, could as well be worked out on a, um, uh, on just a, a pure, you know, random vector? Or is this something where you need other attributes of that quantum state to know what this distance measure should be? So if you have pure states, that's true. But if you have mixed states, then you can't represent your state by a vector anymore. Um, right. Okay. Fair enough. Okay. But then these things, I see. I mean, we're having a bit of a conflict here of how many symbols we should be introducing and how many. So that's why up above at the beginning of the document, I have a list of all the ones that are absolutely necessary and all of the ones that are, um, you know, ancillary that would be nice to have, but are not necessary. Uh, but I mean, so when you say different methods here, I mean, is, is it the case that these are somehow supposed to be sort of the same thing or are they, are these really measuring completely different things? They're measuring completely different things, but they're all, you know, uh, you know, uh, they all satisfy, you know, the properties that any metric must satisfy. Fair enough. Well, okay, so they're pretty much directly analogous to these things. And each one, yeah. in the case of matrix, uh, in the case of vectors, would have some form right. that is a pure sort of mathematical form, I might say, without the metadata. Exactly. I, th I think these are notions of distance in the space of Hermitian matrices, basically. Yeah. Okay, so we have a notion of a matrix distance, as I recall. Some of these distances operate on on matrices. If so I maybe the thing to do would be to just uh, we have um, a, the Frobenius norm for for matrices, for example. Where is that here? In it's probably not here. It would be a norm. Oh, that's a norm, as in for a single matrix. Right. Right. Here we we could say you can have a distance as the norm of a difference of matrices, right. right? But but these these distances are not defined in that way. They they are like traces of square roots of matrices and things like that. Well, look at that. That's the way that works. Mm -hmm. hmm. Okay. I mean, yeah, it's not obvious, you know, method options typically mean you're going to get the same answer more or less 
but it might be more efficient or there might be some arbitrary thing about whether you draw the jagged line in this way or that way or whether you draw so they don't tend to be intending to uh you know represent really different um um you know re re really different results but let's mm -hmm. come back to this um you know somewhat shocking i need to get myself a piece of chocolate i am otherwise not going to be able to continue thinking properly i will be right back please continue So perhaps I think what Stephen was saying is that perhaps we can have a third argument for the distance function rather than a method option. Okay, that that could work. I don't know whether we have a precedent for that in any of the, our distance functions. All right. So this is the block sphere business. Mm -hmm. Can I do that with more than? Yeah, um, you can do it with as many as you want. You could even, you could put in, um, uh, I think S3 was the mixed state. Um, so you can add in S3 there. Um, So one, two. It just, it automatically normalizes um, everything. So one, two is really one over square root three, two over square root three. Okay. So if I were to go here, just so I understand this picture, if I were to say, Well, that's because you have two two plot style arguments. That should be fixed. You, you it shouldn't care about the. It should just use the ones it has. Okay. Um. And arguably, okay. I mean, this this particular thing. If we're really going to have this thing, and by the way, the fact that the sphere is so far away from its. I know you mentioned that before. I don't know how to fix that, but. Well, somebody can help you with that. Yes. It's a lot of these graphics things that say, it seems like, you know, the visualizations is not my strong suit. Um, so, but it's more the idea that I'm trying to get at. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So that's one zero representing. Now, if I were to take this as a four dimensional object, so then you okay. can't actually do it on the block sphere because okay, that's what not, a, not a qubit. Um, so this only works for qubits. Exactly. Which is why the quantum block plot is also one of the um, not necessary, but um, would be nice functions. Now, I mean, given that you're doing this, in principle, like geolist plot, you can unravel this block sphere onto a projection, right? Okay. I, mean, I don't see why you can't. You can obviously yeah. do. Then isn't there some way? Isn't this block sphere? Isn't the conformal? What is it called? The the um. Oh gosh, what the heck is the projection where you where you shine a light source at the top? What is that called? You know what I'm talking about. Um, orthographic or something like that? Mm -mm. No, there's another term for it in complex analysis. Stere stereographic? Stereographic, yeah. Yeah, stereographic. Um, I don't know whether that's illuminating in this case, but that's certainly something, you know, in terms of pure visualization, um, that could be... So that would represent... <laughs> Um, in a direct product state of the kind that you are described, that, that's supposed to be a direct product state. Is that correct? Uh, no. So for quantum block plot, you just, you list the different states that you want on the plot. Oh, I see. 
So that's why I said you could even add in S3 there and then, you know, like yellow or something. And even though S3 is a mixed state, it's still a qubit. So it will still plot on the block sphere. It would just not be on the out, like the edge of the block sphere. Oh, I see. That's interesting. Okay. Well, so much for my projection idea. And that's because the normalization of the thing is, I mean, it's not, you're saying it's not a unit vector on the sphere by the time it's a mixed state. Exactly. Okay. And, and completely fully mixed states actually reside directly at the center of the sphere. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So there's a, okay. So let's keep going here. So this is all stuff about states. Right. So um, if you go down further, um, you know, we saw the quantum matrix operation stuff, the quantum circuits. Now you can make it out of um, quantum operation, like the quantum matrix operations um, and out of Boolean functions. Um, and I'm working on adding in uh, quantum algorithms like, um, you know, you could put in like like Deutsch's algorithm or Grover's algorithm or, or Shore or something like that um, with some specifications. And it would this generate is a somewhat funky notation here. So you need right. to put in which qubits or qubits each of your operations is acting on. Right. I mean, it feels like something like, okay, so in functional programming, how would we do that? Answer, it's something like the curry operation, isn't it, Jose? Okay. Don't you think? Because curry would say, I've got my F, and I'm going to operate on a certain, let me remind myself how curry works. Yes, it will be a list of, of uh, slot numbers, basically. Right, notice that baguette there. See that multiplication sign there? That is a baguette that needs to be squashed. Uh, yes. yes. That's mm -hmm. probably a, a Sushma thing. Um, yep. Okay, so this is like two, three, two, four, or something here. Um, yes. In general, that would be a permutation, but it can also be three to four, and then it will wait for four arguments and take uh, the third, the second, the fourth. Okay. So what we've got here is two functions. What would we do? Let's imagine that quantum circuit just did a composition. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, let's call it fx and f f tof. Okay, so it's fx is acting on uh, the first. So the thing we've got here, if it was a list. See, I'm, I'm a little bit confused because that's a curried, oh boy. Let's say our quantum function really was acting on one, two, three, four, okay? That it was really a four function. Am I making sense? Yeah. But we wanted to break that function down What have we done with neural networks for this? How does NetChain refer to its to the elements? Boy, there's a bunch of baguettes here in this um, prototype version. But you understand my question? I mean, when, when we're doing things here, I guess it's all different. Is it different? I mean, the, the, these are successive layers that are operating on, you know, the wires that come out of one layer. This is a little different because this is saying, well, now I could have the Toffoli gate act on one, couldn't I, as well? There'd be nothing wrong with doing something like this. Is that no, correct? You could, totally, you could absolutely do that. It would just make a different circuit diagram. Yeah, yeah, I understand. Okay, fine. 
So what this is saying is we've got two functions. So you, you get my analogy with, with the um, functional programming thing, right? So maybe yes. we should think about this as being an, a function of four arguments. Okay, what is a circuit? Is a circuit... Uh, uh, so, sorry, the, the difference is that we need the function to return four arguments again, so that... That is probably several arguments again. Yeah, right. So I mean, in the case of Boolean function, we would do something like this. By the way, the background noise will be good to mute. Um, okay. So that's all well and good. That Boolean function has three arguments. The problem is it's not icy. Okay, that's very interesting. That's life in the quantum world, that functions don't return a single result. Hmm. Well, what is the thing that represents an identity, the state here? So this is returning... You see what I'm saying? If I, if I say operate with that function on one quantum state, I'm getting out another quantum state, if I understand correctly. So this is something that I'm uh, currently working on, is uh, instead of operating with the quantum circuit on a quantum state with the, in the same way that we get um, properties of the quantum circuit, um, that's where quantum evaluate comes in. Um, but... I think what you're meant, what you're talking about is when I do quantum evaluate of the circuit and um, right now it works for quantum operations. So if you put in like X uh, goes to one and then you did like S1 or something. That acted on the quantum state and changed it. Okay, so if I say this goes to two here, so that's because of the quantum state you're using. Okay. Um, it has some symmetry property, right? Okay, all right, okay, fine. <clears throat> um, but uh, this will generalize to quantum circuits, where you can just say circuit, um, and then quantum state, um, and you'll be able to evaluate like that. And then there should be an option that specifies whether you want the result to be a quantum state, like the quantum register um, that I showed you in the, the Boolean circuit case, um, or you want to actually put your result into a classical register, meaning measure it. Okay. But, but look, I mean, this notation of, this is a very weird notation at some level, because what we have normally as something like the function function, what do we have normally? I mean, so the, the, the problem here is that because we have this need of returning several things rather than a function approach, it's better to have a transformation approach, like the geometric transformations that take vectors and return vectors. Mm -hmm. So so here we need this, this, this more symmetric approach of taking vectors rather than arguments. Okay. Fair enough. Or, or it's more like something like a um, <clears throat> a matrix product or something. Right. So, exactly. so in other words, your claim is that we basically have to represent the the states are like lists. Right. Okay. So let's take a look at what that would look like. Let's say we've got a list A, B, C, D. And we've got functions that act on subparts of that list. Um, do we have a precedent? Um, is it basically sparse array? Is sparse array basically this precedent? You know what I'm saying? Because if we will, we, let's say we have a transformation matrix acting on this. Mm -hmm. We would say sparse array of, let's say, you know, 1, 1 goes to, you know, uh, P11, 3, 4 goes to P12. P34, let's say. Mm -hmm. And then that gives us a sparse array, which can then act on ABCD. Right. 
That was a very weird result. Why is oh I see because it isn't a four by four. Okay. All right. So that is an analogy, in my opinion, mm -hmm. to what we're doing here. That is, that's saying these are the matrix rows and columns that this particular, in this case, just pure product thing is going to act on. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yep. Mm -hmm. So I think the analog here, the, the correct form of quantum evaluate, and I think actually it's better, hmm, I don't even know if quantum evaluate is the right term, but, but you know, the thing it would be is quantum evaluate of, and then the analog of this, which is not a precise analog, Is something like that. So you're just reversing the order. That's what I think I'm saying, yes. Okay. I mean, does that make sense to... I mean, I think this is our closest analog to this kind of behavior. Okay. Um, also, I just wanted to point out um, the quantum evaluate. The reason that I decided on that name, and I'm uh, very open to um, other suggestions, is because, uh, one, that's the name that you mentioned um, in your post, um, and oh, also, well, okay. Yeah, well, it's cute. Um, okay. And then because uh, in addition to having this be a classical simulation, um, like right now we are simulating quantum uh, computation on a classical computer through Mathematica, um, but we also were talking about the possibility of integrating this with an actual quantum computer, an API. Yeah, um, if somebody could actually deliver that to us. Right. And so if... Uh, if we want that to be the case, one possibility would be to, to have an option that says quantum evaluate um, of um, back end goes to, mm -hmm. um, and then we could have the quantum computer thing because that's how it's done in the Python um, uh, quantum information science kit that I was talking about, um, which does integrate with IBM quantum experience. Um, they say back end goes to. Really? Has anybody actually seen it run? Uh, yeah. So I've actually, uh, I've used it before. With an actual quantum computer, not a simulator it, at the back end. Yeah, it, and it returns for you uh, results on the performance. Um, you can also specify number of trials, um, which is another option that we should support. Fascinating. Those guys have promised to get us access to that thing for, what is it, three years now? Um, it's fascinating. Um, and unfortunately, I do have to go. Um, uh, I have... Uh, okay, Well, okay. We've got quite a bit more to do here. All right, well, we'll have to continue another time. Yes. Um, all right, good stuff. Okay. See and there's later. much more to talk about in terms of uh, uh, the quantum neural nets. Uh, I, I was reading a lot of papers on, on them and trying to figure out Okay. Oh. Well, that was my challenge to you was, was whether this formalism can support those things. So, so. I think it can, um, but there's one thing that uh, just I'll mention now and we can, uh, you know, ruminate on until next time is um, supporting um, control flow in a quantum circuit in, in, instead of just having operations and measurements. Um, because one thing that you need, not just for... Sure. Um, yeah, for, but, okay. So do you think you know how to do control flow? I don't know how to do that at this point. Does anybody? I don't know. I'm sure I've somebody does. I'm, I've never heard of it. Yeah, I mean, because these things are usually straight line, you know, they're just straight line right. programs. Especially if we want to actually be like, have this go through an actual quantum computer. I'm not sure if that's possible, but that's something that you do need um, in order to, from what yeah, I've I seen. think one is far away from being able to do that. Just like, this is the thing that basically does Boolean functions. I mean, that's what the current formalism is about. Mm -hmm. um, but in order to, for instance, simulate nonlinearity um, in a quantum circuit, you need to do something called a uh, repeat until success procedure. Um, yeah, where, like, just like a, a, a general recursive function that has to, you know, has a, it has to have some kind of mu operator type thing. Anyway, okay, let's, let's wrap it up for right now. Um, and uh, um, okay. 
to people who are on the live stream. Until next time, uh, uh, see you later. And um, let's uh, take it from there. All right.